Uh, so this is an, a, an egg cell. And when it's fertilized and you wait a little bit, shake it up, cook it up, and you end up with one or more of these uh, if you're lucky. And this is really quite a remarkable process. I think I don't need to tell you that, but trying to understand how this happens, you have to understand epigenetics. How is it that cells with very similar genomes are able to produce cells with all of these varieties of functions and maintain those functions and cell identities for up to 120 or so years in some very lucky individuals? How does that happen? And Fortunately, we have increasingly better tools to understand how this actually happens. Um, in, this, in these babies, actually, there's, there's 26 billion cells. Each one of them has to be stably maintained. And if you get a rogue cell, you get cancer. If it becomes dysfunctional, you get disease, or at least a bunch of cells and tissues. And one of the first people that got a lot of credit for trying to understand in concept how this happens from a a fertilized cell um, or a stem cell to a tissue is Conrad Waddington, who in the 1950s proposed what you may have heard of as the Waddington hypothesis, which is the idea that cells that have no identity will metaphorically roll down a hill and end up in valleys where they stay so that they don't, a skin cell doesn't suddenly turn into a liver cell and a kidney cell doesn't turn into an eye cell. Of course, there's, there's many cells within those tissues as well that needs to be maintained. But in the aging field, we very rarely, if ever, thought about development and vice versa. Those studying development had really little interest in aging. But uh, that's changing. Uh, many people in the aging field have now thought about this at least, that perhaps aging uh, may not be a evolutionary conserved process to cause aging. We don't believe aging is a, an adaptive event, but it may be related to the epigenome. And what I mean by that is, and there's increasing evidence uh, across the field, some from, from my lab over the last decade, is that cells that are terminally differentiated can actually move around on this Waddington landscape uh, and start to become more like other cell types over time. And we see this happen during aging. We don't know if it causes aging, but it certainly doesn't help their gene expression patterns. And in my lab, we call this X differentiation. Uh, you can call it what, are you, what you want, it could be epigenetic drift, epigenetic noise, uh, but it definitely happens when you look. And we have tools now to look at this at the single cell level. So that's, that's pretty well established. But the question is, could you ever get the cells to go either back up the hill and go back to where they came from um, or ever go back all the way up the hill. Well, we know from Shinya Yamanaka's work that you can go all the way back up the hill, but can you go sideways? That's been the question. So a little bit more uh, representation of what I'm talking about. This is uh, the chromosomes in a cell. This could be a yeast cell, could be a mammalian cell. They're shown in black and these are areas of heterochromatin, which silence genes. Some of them are found at the periphery, such as uh, the sirtuins that I've been working on for most of my career. They control silencing and heterochromatin. Um, and there are open genes that transcribe RNA. And th those genes are on and often in loops that are exposed to, the, to uh, the cell machinery. But over time, what we see is changes in those and ge genes that should be left on become switched off and vice versa. And we believe this is leading to a partial loss of identity. But the question is, why would this happen? How does it happen? So we can do two tests. One is, and what we've actually done, is test some cellular perturbations. We've tried DNA damage and we've tried cell injury and asked, do these, does that mimic the natural changes during aging? And this um, was a review that came out. Um, it was in Cell by Jan Vai, if you say it correctly. And what he was describing was a study where we created breaks in mammalian culture, uh, mammalian cells, and in mice. And we found that the relocalization required these uh, DNA damage checkpoint proteins. So this wasn't just a, a random drift. 
that this really was an active process that required phosphorylation, chemical modification of the actual histones at the break. And it's one of the first steps, the movement of SIRT1, which is the homologue of the SIRT2 yeast gene that I talked about. This enzyme uh, gene product, the enzyme moves to the breaks, recruits repair proteins, uh, and then most of it goes back to where it came from. And we could see this also recapitulated during aging, this process of moving away from the SIRT1 regulated promoters. This enzyme was very useful to us. It's been used to, to study DNA break repair for many years in vitro, but we started to use it in vivo. I use it, we use it in our lab because it doesn't cut very often. There's only uh, about 18 consensus sites um, across the genome. It does cut the RDNA, which we had to be very careful. We weren't just trashing the genome, but um, it's been very useful because it, it stimulates a very, very mild damage response. In fact, it's so mild, you can barely detect any activation of these factors. Um, by a Western blot, you won't see P53 activated, for example. It's, we call it chromosome tickling to distinguish it from other types of studies. 